All right, thank you. Uh, for those of you who are extra astute, you'll notice that uh, the title here is not the title that's in, uh, in the abstracts, and I apologize for that, but uh, we're not quite ready to, uh, to share uh, our new data. So I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, um, but, but carrying on in the same theme that, uh, that Bruno has, has started with. Um, and, uh, and I guess the, the first question is, why, why do we care about, about when the continental crust formed? Right? And I guess the, the, the easiest way to, uh, to argue for the importance of this study is that the continental crust forms the archive of, of Earth history. And, uh, and as, uh, as the Melk Abbey beautifully illustrates, uh, it's important to, to be able to have an archive, a library, to go back in time and, and try and understand um, how the continental crust uh, grew and, uh, and some of the, uh, the interesting things we can glean from that. But unfortunately, uh, for, for the geologists, uh, the continental crust looks less like the Melk Abbey and more looks like uh, the office of a, of a hoarder. So uh, how, how do we... How do we extract information from, from uh, a, an archive that, that looks like this? Well, um, the reason why we need to figure out how to do this is because the vast majority of our natural resources are contained in the continental crust. And, uh, and when we look at the, the distribution, the temporal distribution of many of those natural resources, we see an episodic distribution. Uh, so we have here episodic distribution of mineralization. We see the same thing in passive margins. And, and then aside from our uh, natural resources, we see the same episodic distribution in eclogites, granulites, and probably most famously, detrital zircon. So there's a, there's a recurring theme in this, this archive that we have very clear temporal distributions or, or episodic distributions in, uh, in a variety of geologic proxies. So. Uh, as, uh, as my, my title suggests, I'm going to focus in on uh, the, the zircon record. And, and, and Bruno has already showed uh, this, this uh, perhaps embarrassing uh, figure um, showing how in, in the past, uh, what, 50 years, um, we really haven't come to any greater consensus as to when the, the continental crust formed and, and uh, the mechanisms that were driving that continental crust. But, from all of these models, we can, we, can distill, we can distill these models into two basic forms. And the first is uh, an, an episodic growth, whereas the, the crustal growth uh, increases quickly. And then you have periods of quiescence, and then crustal growth and quiescence. And the, the other set of models is more of a steady state crustal growth. But the, uh, the peaks and troughs that we're seeing in uh, not only the, the zircon record, but other uh, geologic proxies is representative of crustal recycling. And so uh, our crustal growth maintains a steady, steady state growth through time. But because of various tectonic processes, we're then recycling that crust, thus creating these, these peaks and troughs. So again, we've got these two models. Either the, the, the episodicity in the detrital zircon record represents increased magmatism, ergo greater zircon production during certain periods in, in Earth history, or it represents uh, increased preservation during steady state zircon production, um, which gives us this preservation bias. So, very quickly, I'm going to go through some work that, uh, that was just recently accepted uh, in Geoscience Frontiers, where we went to the, the Grenville orogeny, and we collected a, a series of sediments that, uh, that span the, the Grenville orogeny. So we have sediments that were deposited during the continental collision at about 1 to 1.1 billion years, and then we have sediments that were deposited after the continental collision. And we used these, these two groups of sediments to understand uh, how this, this detrital zircon peak that we see in the modern uh, rivers developed through that orogenic cycle. So in the sediments that were deposited during the, the Grenville orogeny, we see a series of, of broad, small peaks going back to the, the last supercontinent at Nuna at about 1.8 GA until around the, the, uh, the time of, of major collisional orogenesis. And then when we looked at the post-Grenville sediments, we see that 
uh, a very different character where we have a single dominant peak centered at uh, roughly the timing of peak orogenesis uh, at about 1050 and then very muted peaks prior to that. So the model that we've proposed is that during the subduction phase or, or as the, the supercontinent is assembling, we have steady state zircon production creating these small broad peaks, but that we have then subduction erosion that is recycling the oldest material. This is similar to what we see in the Andes, where on the coast of the Andes, we currently have Carboniferous and Permian plutons that are being subducted, eroded away, but we have then steady state, more or less steady state crustal growth in the modern arc. This is then, this continues to bias the, the detrital zircon record until the collisional phase when subduction erosion effectively stops and we then have uh, a suite of zircons that we argue are produced during collision related magmatism and that is then the signal that is preserved in, in the detrital zircon record and, and to note the, uh, the, if I jump back here, in the post-Grenville sediments, these are sediments that were deposited uh, in, in one instance at 750 million years, so uh, about 300 million years after orogenesis ended, and that same, that same pattern uh, or that same age peak is preserved until the present. So these are preservation biases that are extremely long-lived and, uh, and don't go away very easily. So, we argue in this paper that, uh, that these detrital zircon age peaks, at least the one associated with Rodinia and the Grenville orogeny, is evidence of increased preservation due to uh, collisional orogenesis. So when we look at then the global record of detrital zircons, and we take into account that these, these age peaks are likely a product of enhanced preservation, uh, how, do we, how do we extract information from a, from a record that is inherently biased? So one approach that people have taken is, uh, is they say, well, this is a, a problem that can be solved with large numbers. If we, if we analyze enough zircons, we can, see, we can see the signal to noise and get at the, the, primary, the primary signal. So recent crustal growth models have used a, a wide array of, uh, of zircon analyses uh, with, then, with then Bruno and Elena's work uh, using m many more analyses than some of the others. And, uh, and when we plot up at least those, those most recent uh, crustal growth curves, we still get a, a variety of, of episodic models versus steady state models. Now, as Bruno described, the, the data go through a variety of filters in order to, uh, what, only use those zircons which we assume represent primary juvenile crust, so, so uh, actual new crustal growth rather than just reworking. But if we were to then take this to the extreme and, and we thought, okay, well, if we're going to apply these same filters or these proxies to a, a much larger database, can we, can we start to uh, pull apart some of the nuances? Can we see that signal to noise much better with a very large data set? So we have here compiled uh, over 42,000 zircon hafnium analyses. Uh, these are all from detrital samples. Uh, but the detrital samples range in, in age. Um, and then I've highlighted here uh, the, the zircons from the Jack Hills uh, just to, to show that our, our understanding of Hadean crustal growth is, is almost exclusively limited to those zircons analyzed from the Jack Hills. Um, there's a couple of interesting things that have come out of this very large uh, compilation. And, and one of them is uh, is, is beautifully expressed in the comparison between uh, the, the paper that was, that was published by Nara et al. in 2012 where they propose that there is this, this large uh, magmatic gap in Greenland from about 3.6 to 3.3 uh, where they argue that, uh, that there was no crustal growth. Um, but then when we look at the, this, this new data set, we see that that Greenland magmatic gap 
uh, disappears. So if there was no crustal growth in Greenland, uh, this shows that there was clearly uh, zircons forming in other parts of, uh, around the world. And, and if you look at then this, the, the KDE of uh, these zircons, um, it again appears as though there's really no punctuated growth uh, between uh, 4GA and, and 2.8. Some other interesting things come out of this uh, data set and I think highlight the, the danger of just compiling loads and loads of data. Um, and so we've got here in red the, uh, the large data set and how it compares to then uh, the extremely large voice et al, which is uh, nearly 200,000 uh, detrital zircon ages to that of Belisova et al and Dweem et al. And, and probably the most stark uh, difference is uh, right here in the Neoproterozoic where we don't see the Mesoproterozoic age peak often associated with the Grenville orogeny at, at all in this record, but rather we're seeing uh, an age peak that postdates that by 200 million years. Um, we see different amplitudes of some of the age peaks. We see again uh, a very large 2.5 GA peak. And, and I think uh, this, this bias is, uh, is likely due to the, the uh, influx of ages from particular regions uh, around the world and, and particularly in, uh, in China. If we look at then uh, another way to visualize the data to, to again highlight this bias, if, if we contour the, uh, the data looking at a bivariate uh, kernel density estimation, we see these hot spots that uh, whether or not those actually represent uh, a, a lot of crust that was growing at about plus five epsilon hafnium at 2.5 GA, or whether this means that there were just a lot of people looking at, at uh, rocks of that age and that chemistry. So we plot a, uh, we plot a, uh, meted, a mean, or weighted mean, excuse me, a running mean through this. Uh, we see that for the, the bulk of Earth, Earth history, the the running mean is, is virtually right at the, uh, the chondrite reservoir and isn't until uh, really the assembly of Gondwana that we start to get this large drawdown. Um, we can also do the same thing with a, a much larger uh, zircon oxygen database where uh, we see very clearly the stepwise function at about uh, 2.4 GA where prior to that we have very low, more subdued zircon oxygen values. Uh, implying that we had less amounts of supracrustal reworking and then post, uh, post 2.4 GA, which actually coincides nicely with the great oxidation event, uh, we, have, we have these what appear to be pulses of uh, enhanced crustal reworking, supracrustal reworking. So then if we take this, this large data set and we apply the, uh, the corrections of, of Belisova and Duim et al., we see that uh, this, the, the crustal growth curve is not nearly as pronounced, uh, but is much more subdued. And uh, we argue that if we then take the, the new crust, or, or what, what Bruno refer, referred to as the juvenile crust, and we, we then take the difference between the corrected crustal growth curve and the new crustal growth curve, we can then assume that this is the reworked crust which, which equates to about 45%, and this, this isn't reworked crust through time, but just in total, we have about 45% of the current volume of the crust represents reworked crust. Um, however, given that this crustal growth curve is biased based upon this preservation, uh, this preservational bias, um, it, I, I wonder if our true crustal growth curve uh, looks something much more like this, where we reach an equilibrium of crustal growth uh, after the Archean, as is suggested by the oxygen isotopes, and that this crust has been removed by, uh, by tectonic processes such as subduction erosion. And I'll leave it right there.